Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered if you're going to make it, how you're going to make it, or how in the world to vault past your hurdles, then do we have the Everything is Possible show for you. Today, I'll be talking with Jen Bricker, one of the most energized and inspiring people I've ever met, and I haven't even really just met her yet. She's an incredible (laughs) athlete, gymnast, aerial artist. She's even toured with Britney Spears and much, much more, and the author of an incredibly inspiring read, Everything is Possible. And that's just what we'll be talking about today, about finding the faith and courage to follow your dreams. That plus we'll talk about Pink Power Rangers, the power of ALF, a trampoline and popcorn, the importance of the Lion King, lifeguard rescues by Robbie, the importance of Hardy's ham and cheese sandwiches with the white cheese instead of the yucky orange, (laughs) and why in the world you don't want to leave your legs in the bathroom. (laughs) Gotcha. So welcome to the show, Jen. Are you ready to shine? Oh, hey. Yes, I am. That was amazing. <laughs> you got me cracking up over here. <laughs> awesome, awesome, and a mighty woohoo! So, so glad to have you on the show. I read your book. There was laughing. There was crying. There was more crying. These are tears of joy. Maybe before we go into all of that, you can take us back to the beginning, if you wouldn't mind, all the way back to when you were born. Yes. Well, I think a lot of the a major part of, of the powerfulness of my story started before I was born and with my parents. My my parents had three boys, 10, 12, and 14 years old, and my mom always wanted a baby girl. I mean, she just felt like, I know I'm supposed to have four kids, but after my third brother she had to have a hysterectomy so she couldn't have kids anymore Mm -hmm. and but she never gave up you know she kept praying and believing for 10 years that she was going to have a baby girl and then one day she heard about this girl born without legs who was put up for adoption and needed a home and it was like that was it she was just like oh yep she must be mine (laughs) And, and then that was it and so she talked to my brothers and my dad and asked them you know how they would feel about um, having a a sister or a daughter without legs and talk to all of them. And one of the coolest things, they sat my brothers down individually Mm -hmm. and asked them these things and said, well, you know, what would it mean to you? And how would you feel if you had a friend come over or once you started dating somebody and they saw your sister without legs and maybe they had an issue with it? And they all three separately at 10, 12, and 14 years old, said, well, if they have a problem with her, then I wouldn't want them in my life anyway. Awesome. I mean, that's amazing. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in that moment, but it's very touching to me. And then they just, they got me in record time at three months old. I had lived in a foster home for the first three months. Mm And my name was actually Holly Ann for the first three months of my life. That's a different name. And when my parents adopted me as a gift to my brothers, they let them choose my name under one condition. They all had to agree on a name, which you can imagine how difficult at that age that was. And I heard that was quite a scene in and of itself. But they, they just raised me totally just normal, you know, and... There was no, really, honestly, no difference whatsoever. I didn't, I didn't grasp that by not having legs, that was something that was so different. And I just came out an athlete. I came out physically just capable and climbing trees and outside and jumping off of things with my brothers and, you know, kind of roughhousing and things like that. It sounds like the word, the four letter C word, can't was not in your family's vocabulary. Absolutely. It's beyond a saying that, right? It's because words without actions are just nothing. They're, they're void and they're empty. And so it was a lifestyle. It was, they really believed that. They believed in me. And well, if you want to do something, you're just going to put your mind to it. And there's no doubt, quoting them, there's no doubt in my mind that you'll do it. And it just, Boom, it was so confident, so straight, so forward. And it wasn't, well, here's all the reasons why you can't do this. Even when I came to them and I said, okay, 
I want to play basketball, softball, volleyball, power tumbling, all against able-bodied athletes, no prosthetics, no wheelchair. And then I even came to them and said, oh, I want to go roller skating too. That was that was the one that got me, and and I, I was a sponsored rollerblade skater years ago, and I'm 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 going, how, how, uh, okay, that must have been an interest, interesting situation in the store. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly that moment where I'm trying these skates on my hands, and these people must think, okay, they've lost their mind. Like, what is this girl doing with skates on her hands, right? But I was obsessed with winning the limbo at the roller rink because I grew up in the middle of nowhere. And that's what everybody did for fun. And so I put the skates on my hands Mm -hmm. and I won the limbo every single time after that. So that's what (laughs) I do with them. (laughs) That's cool. A serial winning of the limbo competition. There you go. (laughs) So tell tell us about some of the interesting things are are both how you were how you were treated in school and and people who really helped you. And maybe you can tell us the power of the little red wagon. Yes, absolutely. So where I grew up, I mean, it's it's a very small community, very small town in southern Illinois, cornfields, cows, that kind of thing. And my community, my teachers, my coaches, my peers, they had played such a role in my life. And that I really wanted to highlight that in my book. And I and I do a lot in my speeches, too, or or just interviews and showing that You know, I got where I am today because of all of the people that have poured into me, shaped me, molded me, loved on me. And the power of the red wagon, Penny, she's like four foot nothing. Mm -hmm. And she was uh, my assistant when I was younger in school and when I started school in kindergarten. And they wanted to kind of have someone carry me or, you know, have a wheelchair or something when I got off the bus in the morning and I just, I don't know, I'm such a, it cracks me up to, to talk to my teachers or my parents about how I was as a kid because they're just like, well, you really haven't changed. Like you were always this person, like you were always bold. You always wanted to do, you were going to do what you were going to do. And I don't remember a lot of this stuff, but they, I guess I insisted on having a red wagon and I really wanted that you know it made me feel I guess made me feel better and I I was happy about it and so and they were great you know Penny got a red wagon and I got to ride in the wagon and I felt so cool getting off the bus instead of feeling I guess different or awkward Mm -hmm. and it's funny because I wasn't connecting that it was because I didn't have legs or that it was in that category it just didn't, it felt foreign to me and I pushed it away. And that's so fascinating to think back now as an adult. That's, that's clearly intuition going on of how does this feel? Does this feel light? Does this feel heavy? Does this feel good? And you, you just went on instinct. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating to me that I was picking up on that in kindergarten. That blows my mind. It blows my mind. So if we fast forward a couple years, and we're going we're gonna to bounce around a little bit. In fact, I was, I was watching video earlier today of you at seven years old on the trampoline. And I guess if we talk about the limbo competition, this, there's, there's a pattern, there's a theme here. We've got the limbo competition you won, and then a game called popcorn. <laughs> yes. I have popcorn on the trampoline, so... I loved the trampoline and we had one in our backyard and my brothers would always kind of see how high they could they could double bounce me because I was so small and it scared everybody half to, half to death but I was able to control the uh, the height and popcorn was so fun because it's when multiple people are on the trampoline and you you kind of curl up in a ball and you let people pop you around like popcorn and you're all bouncing up and down and it was just it was something I loved so much, and I I knew how to kind of make myself catch the bounce, so I guess I was kind of cheating a little bit, <laughs> playing the system, so that I would be the one that would kind of get popped up a little higher. That's, I that, loved it. That's interesting, because I, I don't want to jump that far ahead yet, but I'm thinking of you, well, I, how did you get into gymnastics, and then you really wanted to do things the way that others did, and so that control that you had on the trampoline ended up coming in handy for sticking it at the end. That's right. It's, it absolutely did. 
I, yeah, the, the thought of a disabled sport, it, I mean, I, I couldn't even understand that. I was just like, why would I be in, that doesn't even make sense to me. And I, I never knew anybody my whole childhood who was, you know, disabled or handicapped or in a wheelchair or missing a limb or anything. I just, I was never in that world. I was never exposed to that. So that wasn't a part of my identity and it wasn't part of my world. Just, it wasn't something I knew. And so all my sports, like I said, were just mainstream sports and I wanted no exceptions made for me, of course, at all. And they weren't. And so I, I came out an athlete, but I, I really was drawn to gymnastics in, in that, in that way. And I remember loving gymnastics and then, you know, we watched the Olympics. We loved the Olympics as a family and it was a, a big deal for, for us to watch. We loved it and we loved gymnastics. And I remember seeing Dominique Mochiano on TV and I was drawn to her. I mean, I, I knew I was Romanian. I knew that my biological family was from Romania and I knew that she was Romanian, that even that she was on the US team, but I knew she was Romanian and we looked similar. We looked alike. And I thought, man, I, and, and this is, you know, I'm growing up where nobody looks like me. I'm growing up in the middle of nowhere and I have, I'm very, I get very tan. I have black, black hair and big brown eyes and nobody, lo- I mean, just no one looks like me in general, let alone seeing someone who really looks like me. And of course, no one's Romanian, no one's anything else, you know, where I grew up. And so it was really, 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 really cool for me to see that. And so it made me gravitate toward her. And I started competing in power tumbling, actually. We didn't have gymnastics, but power tumbling in the Midwest was really, um, really just blowing up. It was like everywhere. And so power tumbling is the actual tumbling portion in gymnastics you have four events the floor the vault the beam and the bars and um the floors is a square floor and that's where they're tumbling so power tumbling is like a runway it's like a strip of a runway floor and you just you tumble and you do different passes is what they're called and so that's what i started competing in and i actually was excelling and i started my my coaches they had never taught somebody without legs i mean this is I was the first, and I think only to this day, person without legs to ever compete in power tumbling. And I went to the state meets. I won state champion in my division one year, went to the national meets. And this, and this then is I able-bodied for, for everybody. I'm, I'm putting able-bodied in quotes. What a weird word, but... Yeah, no, of course, it, yeah, it's, it's able-bodied. I mean, there's there's not any other... <laughs> it, there's just not, you know? And, um, and then I went to Junior Olympics and placed fourth in my division and... You know, so, and at the time, I mean, I'm not really at all, people were telling me how inspiring I was, and I was on all these news, you know, newspapers, news stations, I was, I went to Germany, and was on, like, a, the Oprah, basically, of Germany, and I was on Inside Edition, I was on Maury Povich before it switched and became what it is today, and so, all of these things that I wasn't getting, it. I was actually irritated as a kid by the word inspiration, I'm like, I don't get it. Why am, why are you telling me that I'm an inspiration, but my friends aren't an inspiration? Like it just obviously didn't make any sense to me. And, um, so it's just, it's amazing to think back of how, how I got started in all of that. Well, at the same time, you're, you're getting into tumbling, you're doing all these physical activities. I was really drawn to the, uh, the perch in your backyard apple tree. Mm, I love the apple tree in my backyard. I loved to read and so I would just, <laughs> exactly that, I would climb the tree, mm-hmm. and there was just this place where these branches kind of came like that, and it was a perfect place to just slide my butt right in there, yep. and well, really my whole body, but my butt kind of like made it stick, and so I just kind of squeezed in my little pocket, and uh, and then I would lay back on the branch and read, and it was just like, Oh my gosh, I loved that play. It was I get I'm excited thinking about it now because it was like quiet and peaceful and I was just fully engrossed in my book and it was it was such an awesome place to have as a kid up to any actually any time in your life, but as a kid it was just it was awesome. It was kind of almost magical. And it seems like you had a very powerful you had the on switch 
of go, go, go. And I'm not sure we want to call it an off switch, but the contemplative, the inner, let's read, let's be quiet, let's soak it all inside as well. It's funny you say that because I never thought, I've never said that out loud, but, but I do that all the time now. I mean, oh my gosh, I, because I, I travel so much, I speak, you know, as, as a speaker, I do so many interviews and then performing and all of these things or, or just meeting people that want to know about my life or things like that. And so I 100% always, I mean, daily have my alone quiet time. So many people I hear them say, oh, I don't want to sit alone in the quiet. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I love sitting in the quiet. Are you kidding me? Like, I love just no noise, just low lighting. I don't like bright lights. Mm -hmm. I just want this soft lighting or, you know, just sit on my couch and binge watch a TV show or something. I, I need that to recharge. And it, it started when I was a kid and that's amazing. Thank you for saying that, actually. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Woo! -hoo. So from yeah. there, we'll go to the lighter side of, of, of self-discovery. Hardy's ham and cheese sandwiches with white cheese, <laughs> not the yucky orange. Of course. No way. No yucky orange in my mouth. Um, <laughs> so, and it's just, it's almost like it makes me cringe to think that I ate that stuff because <laughs> now I'm, I'm so like Miss Healthy, Miss Natural, Miss Nothing Chemical. So... Growing up, so when I first started the tumbling classes, this was like beginner, beginner in second grade, the gym was actually in a different location, and so we had to drive into the next town, mm -hmm. and it was just my thing. I loved hot ham and cheese sandwiches. I loved them so much, and I wanted it specifically. Of course, here I am. Like Now that I think say these things out loud, I'm like, oh my gosh, my, <laughs> my, my preferences and my like, this is the way I like it, start, it was just always that way. <laughs> And so I had to have the ham and cheese sandwiches with the white cheese before I went and tumbled or I got it before or after I don't remember which but before my tumbling classes and it was just so funny. Now I'm like, oh my gosh, here you are going to do something physical and you're going to fast food and you're getting a hot ham and cheese sandwich, which is probably not even ham or cheese. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. And then you're I, flipping the stomach upside down repeatedly. Exactly, exactly. I'm like, this is, oh my gosh, this is awful. Like, I, unfortunately, whenever I have kids one day, not unfortunately, but I'm just, they are never going to eat those things. It just isn't happening. It's not an option. Sorry. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so taking a path down self-discovery just a little bit more one of the things that I picked up in you and and I know it's been a part of me growing up and and I've been very competitive I raced in Europe in bicycles for a few years did did a bunch of stuff um, and you have you put it best you said that you didn't f want your mom watching you practice because if things weren't perfect for you you got pretty hard on yourself Mm. Yeah, well, 100%. I was very hard on myself. And I don't know, I still don't know why. I mean, my parents were not those kind of parents. They were not like overbearing, domineering, you have to do this. Not at all. I mean, I, everything I did, the sports and stuff, it's because I wanted to do it. They never, ever, ever, ever pushed me. And they weren't, they certainly wouldn't have been mad if I made a mistake. It was just all, I was my own worst enemy. And if I didn't learn something immediately, I was like, oh, wow, I'm an idiot. What's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? I, I don't know if it was like, I just wanted to be, I don't know. It, maybe I'm just like a natural kind of perfectionist. And I didn't know how to control that as a kid. Uh, I'm not really sure, but I was definitely my worst critic. I mean, it's not good to be that hard on yourself. And thankfully my coach has helped with that as well to just kind of be like, Jen, it's okay. This is why you practice. But I was always like, yeah, but I'm different than everybody else. Like, I can pick it up much faster. And I do naturally pick up things. I will say, I mean, yeah, I do pick up things naturally fast, but it was like, okay, Jen, you're human. All right. Knock it off. You're not going to just be good at everything immediately. And in my head it was like, no, but I need to be. There's and there, I don't know. There's a book, and, and we won't go too far down this rabbit hole, but there's, there's a book by a gentleman I interviewed a couple weeks ago, Mark Willin, 
and it's something to the effect of um, it's not your fault inherited family trauma, which says that things that happened in previous lifetimes affected you epigenetically because you were in your mom's womb when things may have happened to her mom and your your cells were actually in your grandma when things may have happened to your mom that could have actually triggered that so it's really literally not you that that wiring came from somebody else and then you're just trip wiring it wow wow that's fin that's fascinating and also makes sense actually totally on a, on like a spiritual level and then also on the like what you're saying on the, on a cellular level that's really amazing and and yeah that makes sense so mm. I'll thank get, you again i'll get you the name of that book afterwards okay and, and great. for everyone since i didn't remember it it'll be in the show notes for people so so let's go from there as we're we're, we're both learning a little bit here and yeah. uh let's talk about disney <laughs> well disney was quite an adventure for me i went to I, I was started community college and I saw this flyer on in the bathroom one day about um, Disney the Disney College program and my sister-in-law had just told me like, several weeks ago about this college program that she did it when she was younger and it was the best thing it's like one of the best decisions she ever made in her life she had friends that you know she was friends she was like friends with lifelong friends and traveled the world and you know because friends from all over and so I was like, man, that sounds amazing. Well, then just a couple of weeks later, I see this flyer and I took that as a sign. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to go to this interview. And so I went to a different college about 30 minutes away. That's where the interviews were being held. And it was like a, a group of us. And this was my first, I, I didn't, my parents didn't want me to have a job until I graduated because they said I would be working the rest of my life. So they, um, so I had never done an interview and this was like a group interview and, you know, you had to be really confident. I mean, it was just like, it was kind of intense at, for, for an 18 year old who, who'd never done that. I mean, I think actually maybe I was, yeah, I was 18 or almost 19. And, um, so anyway, I got the job, but I didn't find out the, they had sent my acceptance letter and I'm like waiting, waiting, waiting. Oh my gosh, I didn't make it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Well, it was delayed because they had sent it to the college and it was Christmas break. So I didn't get it. And it was delayed by like two weeks. By the time I got the acceptance letter, yeah. I was supposed to be in Florida in two weeks. So it was just like, bam, I just moved in two weeks. I was bam up in Florida. And uh, it was like a 15 hour drive. My brother and my dad um, moved me down. My mom had just had surgery and so she couldn't go. She was like devastated. And, um, and then that just, that Disney changed my life. I mean, I was going into fashion. That was like five years. I was like, that's it. I'm going into fashion. That's my whole career choice. Boom, done. And after the first year of being in Orlando, well, after the first couple months, I knew it wasn't moving back. I extended my college program. Mm -hmm. Then I found an apartment once I was done with the program, and I was just living there, you know, off the college program in Orlando. And um, that first year, at the first year mark, I met my old partner Nate who ended up being my performing partner and uh, exclusively business and performing partner, started out just teaching me how to do all the aerial performing and he was uh, refining my technique, my tumbling technique, and teaching me skills, partner skills on the trampoline. Now, now this trampoline is not a backyard trampoline. This is a 12 by 14 competitive $10,000 trampoline that, that you catch some serious air. I mean, it. This trampoline is all about technique. You can't, you know, you make one degree off and then you're you're off. I mean, you're off the trampoline. It's 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 a very um, for advanced people. And so and, and off the I trampoline it, for anybody listening, that's that's almost life or death. I mean, it could literally course, be life or death. Of course, one hundred percent, it could be. And so you really have to be smart. You know, you can't just. You just be an idiot on this trampoline. And um, so before we knew it, I mean, we were practicing like five days a week. I was just all in. And I had made the decision. I had come to a really hard crossroads. You know, am I going to go back to school and go to fashion? Or am I going to start this new career path? And I just I just knew. First of all, I knew I could always, school wouldn't, school is always an option. So, I, but I knew that this wouldn't always be an option. And so um, I took the performing career, which was, obviously the right path for me and that just started man 
just this fast track of an expedited performing career. It started, I started in towards the, started practicing towards the beginning of 2008 mm -hmm. and performed for the first time at the end of 2008. That next year, I was on tour with Britney Spears as a featured act. Well, I your, mean, your first performance was not exactly the small little backyard performance. And no, I did not have the privilege of easing my way into this industry that does not, I mean, and let me tell you, nobody, nobody wanted to hire me. I mean, it, you know, you have to understand, I, there was no one like me doing, being an aerialist or being an acrobat. Just wasn't happening. Never had happened before. And so everybody was really afraid of how an audience would receive me because it had never been done. And so my first gig came because there was a last minute cancellation in a halftime show and they were desperate. And so they needed an act, thankfully. And it was, you know, 5,000 people. I mean, that's not a tiny audience. And, you know, we were the halftime show. So everybody's watching you. And it was a lot of pressure. I mean, even that, that first performance was a lot of pressure and, but we nailed it, you know, we nailed it. Everybody loved it. And that, that was kind of just that, that little tiny crack in the door. Mm -hmm. This was in Orlando. And, and then when I got on tour with Britney Spears, that was, I mean, that just busted my career wide open because we were a featured act. So again, when we performed, everybody was watching the pressure was absolutely insane. Well, I, I will never, there just won't be a moment in my performing career that is that high of intensity. It shot my confidence up. I knew that I could do anything after that point. I and mean, sometimes we had 20,000 people in-house. You talk about, at least for the first 10, being incredibly nervous. What was it? What was your routine? I guess there was some visualization time. What did you do to get yourself in the zone to be able to put yourself out there yep i had a routine so every uh before every show mm -hmm. we so before um we would go out into the arena we had to have these black cloaks on that would cover up our costumes so that people wouldn't know that we were performers walking out to go underneath the stage yep. so i would uh put the the cloak over my head i would go literally and find a corner that was quiet and nobody was there I would um, pray and then I would go and I would visualize the entire performance. So I would, you know, it was like, because also, you know, this, this was also the most technically difficult act. And I guess you, I don't like to say dangerous, but I guess in reality it is because there's two people. Okay. Every move is, is counter. Like it's the timing is everything, you know, one wrong move. And not only am I going off, I'm going off in a huge, like that would, that would have probably, I'm going to say 95% for sure would have killed me. Like, and you know, you don't think about it when you're performing like that. Obviously you just don't allow your mind to go there. But the end of the act, we ended it by these series of him bouncing me higher and higher and higher. And like the number one rule on, on those trampolines is you never double bounce somebody because it's dangerous. But we discovered Somehow, I, I have amazing core strength. I just, I really have good core strength. And I had been working on it and getting in better shape anyway. And just, you know, so when he could double balance me I, and I could control it. So I was catching 20 feet sometimes from the bed of the trampoline. And the bed sits at least five feet from the ground. So you can imagine, I mean, this was insane. And the crowd, the higher I would go, they would just go even more nuts. And so there was so much pressure from the technicality side and then also from if you mess up, you're going to be fired and your career is over and it just started. I mean, it just, there was so much intensity. And yeah, like you said, it took at least the first 10 shows, if not 10 to 15 shows for me to just kind of calm and soak in what was happening and really enjoy this unbelievable time in my life. Wow. And, and you hit an interesting word there that we're going to probably double back around in it. But I, I think it just pulls together an essence. And, and we're certainly going to go in a spiritual direction in a little bit. And it, it has to do with that as well. The strength of your core. Because while you may have 
different abilities everywhere, your core is, well, it's the David and Goliath of cores. Mm. Wow. That, that's, you're right. I mean, that's so funny that you say it that way because it, it is not just a physical core, but it is a spiritual core that has been getting strengthened more and more over time, both physically and spiritually. That's, again, such an amazing revelation that you're just bringing to me. So I feel like I feel like this interview is for me more than for anyone else. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm, I'm betting I'm betting everybody's going to get something out of it. So let's let's throw a beautiful synchronicity in here that had me completely bawling in the middle of your book. And I, I read a book a day for this show, and it's it's not often. It's only happened two or three times, I think, that any tears have leaked. This one completely beyond dumbfounding. You had a poster on your wall growing up. You had an idol, a hero. I don't even know where to begin. Maybe the day that you you, you asked your mom, y- you take it. I don't even know. <laughs> sure. Well, my, my best friend at the time, right before I turned 16, she was also adopted. And she had just found out what her biological last name was. And up until that point, you know, my parents had been so open and honest with my adoption that there was there was just no pink elephant in the room. They were very open. There was no secrets. And I just didn't really have much interest in getting to know my biological family or needing to know. But that day, the thought was planted in my brain. It was planted in my brain. And I say that because why would I think to ask my parents, is there anything you know about my biological family that I don't know about? There's nothing. There, I should never have even thought that. I mean, they were so open. Mm-hmm. And yet I did. So I went home and asked my mom. And to my surprise, she says, yes. And I'm thinking, what do you mean, yes? What? How do you, what? You know something about my biological family? What do you, t-? like, blew my mind. It just tripped me out. I, I couldn't fathom what the heck she could possibly know then she tells me that my biological last name would have been Mochianu and the minute she said that last name I knew I knew that that was the girl that I loved watching as a kid the one that we looked alike I saw all the similarities in. I was drawn to her naturally seven or eight years old so immediately when she said that I knew that she meant Dominique Mochianu was my full-blooded biological sister. How did you even process that? I mean, I, I don't know. It was, you, you have to deal with what you're dealt, right? So you just, I mean, I was like jaw open, in shock. This is unbelievable. This is crazy. Who does this happen to? Oh my gosh. And then I was excited too. And all of the emotions, I mean, all the emotions, you know? And I think deep, deep, deep down, it made sense, Mm -hmm. but I couldn't, I didn't consciously think that, but deep down inside of me, yeah, because I picked up on it as a kid. I mean, we looked looked alike, we're both Romanian, we had similar characteristics, we're both tiny, you know, all of these things. So yeah, I was drawn to her for a reason, but it was like I never would have thought at all, I mean, that, we would have been sisters because it's just it's it's just too impossible of a thing to think and especially as a kid so but it happened (laughs) it was my it was my real life holy crap oh my gosh this is unbelievable moment you know so then how it it sounds like this is something you kind of let evolve over time or grow inside of you you didn't move I don't even know if pacing is yourself, yourself is the right term. How did this all unfold for you? Well, it, it took four years because, you know, my uncle, who was a private investigator, of course, um, he, I had him Yeah, we're going to have to talk about these synchronicities here. Just why not, you know? And um, so he contacted my biological parents because I wanted him to do it the right way. And that was immediately. I mean, that was right when I found out. But they didn't, you know... They had one conversation, 
and then there was no more conversations. They they didn't want to keep it. They they still wanted to keep me a secret. Mm -hmm. So that was my first attempt, failed attempt. And then there was a couple other failed attempts. So it took four years, not because I wanted it to, but just because that's the way it happened. I mean, I knew it had to be done with finesse. I knew that it had to be done right, you know, for them to understand that I was legitimate. And then it finally, my third and final attempt was at the end of 2007, and I just packaged up everything, my heart, my soul, uh, a letter, pictures from when I was a baby, and then all the legal adoption document papers with, you know, signatures and things that, okay, this is legitimate, I'm not crazy. And they, my sister, I have two sisters, so I have a younger sister, Christina, mm -hmm. and an older sister, Dominique, and... Um, and that was amazing. So I, I, I sent them the whole package and I got a response the end of 2007, two weeks after I sent it. And then my Dominique and I had our first phone conversation January 2008. And then all three of us met for the first time in May of 2008. What was the phone call like? The phone call took me off guard because I... I uh, I was on my way to work. I didn't know the number. I answered it anyway. And it was Dominique. So I was like, <laughs> whoa, 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 wait a minute, you know? And I've been legit, I'm just like, uh, I don't, uh, you know, information overload here. It takes a lot to make me speechless. <laughs> and, um, but then it was, but then the conversation flowed very naturally, you know? And, <laughs> and towards the end of the conversation, I realized I hadn't told her I didn't have legs. And so I was like, you know, I'm just going to I'm just going to slip that in real real quick and it's fine, you know, and I told her I didn't have legs and as if she knew. And of course I knew she didn't know. But I was like, "Oh, you know, it's no big deal. It's fine. It's all good." And it was just it was kind of actually really funny because you could just hear like she was really trying to like say the right thing, but she mm -hmm. didn't know what to say and yeah, but she was just really happy overall that I had a good childhood. And, and that, you know, that made her happy. Fantastic. And then you meet a few months later. It sounds like from, I've heard just a little bit of the interviews, that was a really tough challenge for her as well. Um, yeah, I mean, well, just finding out for her, at first, you know, she really had to, um, you know, she was mad at her parents, of course, for, for keeping the secret for so long. And then that was a forgiveness, you know, journey for her. And she eventually forgave them and moved past that. And um, and when she found out, it was very overwhelming because she was pregnant and she was um, in the middle of finals in college. And, you know, it was just a huge shock to her, of course. So, um, but, you know, she welcomed me and they welcomed me. And, and then ever since then, it's just, you know, we've been, it's our own journey. I mean, trying to learn about each other and understand each other and we, we're coming from two totally different families too I mean like the opposite ends of the spectrum here so we have to work through those things of our differences primarily come in how we were raised and our similarities of course are in our DNA I want to talk from here thank you for sharing on that I want to talk from here mm -hmm. about faith and gifts because mm -hmm. I, I heard your sister talk in an interview about how much this was a gift for you to have the family that you were raised with. And it sounds like miracles all the way around. Yep, 100%. I mean, it, you know, I was born without legs for a purpose, for a reason, not by mistake. I was put up for adoption because it was meant to be that way. I had to be in the hospital, I had to be left in the hospital, I had to be in the foster home everything worked out the way it was supposed to work out. You know, as much as I would have loved to have been raised with my sisters and had that, that lifetime together, it couldn't have, I couldn't have been this person without being with my family that raised me. You know, I needed to be raised with them. I needed to be filled and flooded with love and encouragement and self-esteem. And I needed that community. I needed everyone I needed everyone there and so it absolutely was miracles from my parents even getting me I mean everything all the odds were stacked against my parents they were 40 42 years old which in the 80s it wasn't like what it is now where everybody's having babies in their 40s it wasn't like that then 
And also, they had never adopted, never fostered, nothing. I mean, everything was against them, and yet they got me in record time. They never gave up, you know. Um, and I, being raised in my biological family, it just, I needed the family that I was in, and like I said, the community in the town, in order to be who I'm meant to be today to fulfill the things I'm supposed to do in my life now. And it's just so clear to me that that is 100% the way it was supposed to work out. Have you always had this strong of a faith, and what does faith mean to you? Well, faith has been a journey. I mean, I grew up going to church. I grew up in a, um, you know, a, bull, a faith-filled family. And, but, you know, it was also, you can't just make someone have faith, you know? So it was my own journey, and my parents wanted me to have it on my own. They, they wanted me to have my own faith and belief. And so it, it was. I mean, I, um, I decided to get baptized when I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. I grew up going to church camp, all my own choice. And then just as I've gotten older, it's been, I've just gotten a stronger relationship with God, stronger, stronger faith, stronger everything. And it's, but it's been uh, a journey. And it still is. You know, I'm still, I feel like getting strengthened every day. And it's for a purpose, you know, my, my faith and my understanding and um, the strengthening is so that I can keep doing more things for other people, whether it's, you know, continuing to speak, continuing to perform as an aerialist and acrobat, uh, writing a book, continue to write many books, being on TV shows, being on podcasts, um, being in magazines, you know, going into all these different avenues it takes the amount of strength that I have and continually getting strengthened to be able to handle all of those things and keep a balance in my mind. Beautiful. Do you think that everybody has this in them or has this? Can everybody cultivate this greatness in them? Totally. 100%. But you have to want it. You have to be willing to sacrifice. And you have to be willing to... It just, this is what it... It's what I always say. It just comes down to how bad do you want it every time? How bad do you want the relationship? How bad do you want the job? How bad do you want to be happy in your life? And mm -hmm. I, happy doesn't mean an easy life. Happy just means peace and contentment inside and fulfillment that, you know, everyone can have that. But does everyone want it? And how bad do you want it? Because it's going to be the harder path for sure. But it'll be the more rewarding one, 100%. Thank you. Who's uh, hockey player Brody? Oh, Brody. Well, oh my gosh. So when I was 12, 10 or 12 years old, this couple had written to my parents and they had a boy that was born without legs. And I guess as a kid, I kind of schooled the parents and totally how they should be parenting their kid because they were kind of coddling him and mm -hmm. just, you know, being a bit too sheltered. And I guess I got on the phone and just read them the act about, hey, you shouldn't coddle your kid, don't do this, don't do that. And then that was it, like, and my parents tell me the story and I'm like, I said that, oh my gosh, like, I can't, but they, they, they took my advice. I mean, they really did and they were amazing and they totally shifted and they just started letting him do everything and treating him normal and I just, last year, found out that he's now playing hockey for like the Paralympic team for the US he goes around giving speeches, and in his speech, he accredits me as a person that like has, that changed his life. I've never even met him as an adult, and I couldn't. I was so dumbfounded that he was talking about me that I changed his life. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it, and I just found that out last year. So humbling, like so incredibly humbling, and just wow, beautiful. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, woohoo! Definitely. From there, talk to us about uh, the power of love and specifically loving yourself first. Well, love has changed my life. I mean, like I said, and I probably say over and over, all the people poured into me, it's been love. I mean, love has been poured into me from day one. And the only way you can pour love into someone else is when you love yourself first. I mean, you have to. And that is a journey for everybody. It's certainly been a journey for me, and it will be a journey for everyone. But when you can really 
love yourself and love the way you're made and know that it was for a purpose, that you're specifically made and designed and created for a reason. It's it's not by an accident. You don't have to try and change everything about you. I mean, certainly, yes, I'm all about working out, being healthy, being fit. Yes, that absolutely. But loving yourself from the inside, that's the only way you can truly, fully be the best husband, the best wife, the best friend, the best sister, daughter, whatever, to, because then you can really make it about the other person and not be caught up about what's going on with you. Woohoo! How, how did, you've done something interesting a lot of times in your life, which is really listen to the, the inner still voice. And I don't know if it's inner, I don't, I, I don't know if it's still, but you listen to your intuition. How have you done that? And I'm thinking specifically like things like how the Lion King influenced you. Well, I, I feel like that's my faith. You know, I feel like God's leading me and I ask for that. You know, I pray for that and I want to be more in tune with that to, to pick up, you know, your, your intuition or, um, to, to be able to listen and be led. And that again, though, it's like a muscle. I mean, you have to, I feel like, again, if you want it and you seek it, you'll find it, you know, you'll, you'll find it. And, but you, you do have to, there's a certain discipline in these things. And I don't, I don't mean a discipline, like it's a set of rules. I just mean like, it's a muscle that you work Mm -hmm. to be able to, um, really pick up on that and then trust that and, and follow and, and kind of lead into that, you know? And um, let that just be, but it's a surrender. I mean, that's that's the thing is that it's a surrender. So if you've got pride going on, if you've got those kind of things, you've got to let those things go because you are, you're surrendering and, and being vulnerable. And that's not easy. How do you surrender? Because on the one hand, you've surrendered. On the other hand, again, coming back to David and Goliath, you've been fiercely strong. Yep. How do you put those two together? Well, I think they go hand in hand because surrender is not a weakness. And you're not surrendering to, you know, for me, if I'm surrendering my will to, to God's will for my life. That's the whole That's the whole point is that I didn't create myself. I didn't make myself. That's the whole point. And so <laughs> you're surrendering to the right person, right? Mm-hmm. You're not surrendering to a disease or a mindset. You're surrendering to what I believe the person who created me and his will for my life, which was designed in a way. It's not like I'm so smart. I designed and created my own life. No, it was done for me. And this was my whole purpose for why I'm on this earth. And it just, it's ring. It just rings so true to me because I see it. I over and over again, like, yep, that's why. Yep. It just, it's affirmed and confirmed over and over every day of my life. Those are some of the synchronicities. In fact, I, I was mentioning before the show, I was like, you're, you're Ms. Synchronicity. And I guess I'm not the only person who said something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my manager, he's like, you are the most synchronistic person I have ever met in my life. I'm like, I, it's um, I know these crazy, like, you know, crazy good things just happen over and over. It's become a pattern in my life. <laughs> it's just... It just happens, you know, it just happens in my life. And, and certainly there are no coincidences and, and everything happens for a reason. Yeah, and I take those as bookmarks. So it really sounds like you're on path, you're in flow. When those keep happening, I, feel like, I feel like that is God, source, spirit, what, whatever we, we, we label the divine saying, hey, I want you to pay attention. You're exactly where you need to be right now. Yes, 100%. 100%. So before we begin to wrap things up here, how have you dealt with fear, like going on stage or like filling your mask with water while sitting in the bottom of the ocean? Ooh, yeah. Well, it's, it's mind over matter. Those are kind of all, you know, when, it, when I was learning a skill, either as an acrobat or an aerialist, it was just terrifying your mind or you really had to go against what your, your mind is telling and your body are like, don't do this. This is crazy. What are you doing? And you have to override that. So there's a mental toughness there that um, probably, again, it's a muscle you have to just work. And so as I'm sitting on the bottom of the ocean and my mask is filling up because I'm getting certified as a super diver and everything just makes me want to breathe through my nose and freak out and panic, you can't because 
you can't shoot up to the top because you'll bust an eardrum. You just that's not an option. So I just took my time. I was breathing. I was like, don't panic. You're fine. Because when you panic, that's when things happen. That's when you die or you have major accidents or things like that. So it's just mind over matter and building that that kind of mental strength and toughness and knowing that, um, you know, it, I just knew I just knew that I was there. I was supposed to be there. There's a confidence. There's a, there's a peace in that. Knowing that, like you said, you are where you're supposed to be mm-hmm. is – it's huge. It's a huge relief, actually, because you don't have to worry so much. I know when I travel and I'm on planes and I'm in foreign countries, I'm where I'm supposed to be, and I know that I'm protected, and I know I just know that. Woohoo! Do you have a, a meditation or a prayer practice that you do on a regular basis? Yeah, every morning I, I pray, I read the Bible, I um, I have like a daily devotional that I read, and so they're just kind of all different forms, and I actually send out text messages with um, like Bible verses and scriptures. There's always one that will stand out to me every day, and so I have, now it's grown into this chain of like over 40 people, and then they all send it too, so it's like who knows how many people now are, are getting getting that every morning. So it's, it's just really cool how that's happened. Very cool. What yeah. advice would you give if, if you were speaking to parents today, sort of like Brody's parents, but just in general, what advice would you give to parents for their kids today? So many things, but I, I think I guess the first one that comes to my mind is just allow your child to be who they were created to be, not who you want them to be. And that is, that's not easy as a parent. I don't take that lightly. I don't, I don't think that that's an easy thing. But I think that that is very empowering and, and you're giving them their own voice and more importantly, their own mind. And that is a skill that I can tell you personally will translate and transcend into their adult life and make all the difference in the world because they need that confidence to think for themselves, not to just ask everyone else what their opinion is, but be confident and know that they have a head on their shoulders. And that comes from the parents telling them, you have a good head on your shoulders. We raised you to have a head on your shoulders and to be independent. So you're going to be fine, you know? (laughs) Woohoo! Yeah. So what a question we like to ask just before the end is what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I Mm -hmm. call the woohoo factor? Oh my gosh. So many things. Tiny animals. I lose my mind. Uh, Nature. Being just kind of being in awe of being so small in, in the grand scheme of things. Good company, staying around a fire, just good people having good conversation, of course, with yummy food, the foodie in me. And yeah, good company, good food, nature, and a strong sense of community. Like those things fill me from the inside. Being around my family and my community, that just, that fills me. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So where can people go to find out more and to find your beautiful, beautiful book? Oh, thank you. You can find my book everywhere. Books are available, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, um, all the, a lot of the airports around the U.S. have it. And it's also in an audio version, which I read. So if you like oh, audiobooks, cool. you can hear me talk about it. Yeah. And your website URL? My website is jenbricker.com. Fantastic. And if you're driving down the road and you didn't catch that, come on over to inspirenationshow.com. We'll get you over to Jen's website as well. So before I let you go, any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today? Just know that you are significant. Your talents and your gifts matter. They're there for a reason. They can change someone's life and they're equally as powerful as anyone else's gifts. And what you bring to the table matters. Go out, find out what that is, dig deep and just change someone's life. Woohoo! So I feel called to ask, and we don't even need to include this if, if there's nothing that you want to share, but do you have a, a prayer, a devotional, a meditation, a spiritual word that you'd want to give us before letting you go? Well, my book, Everything Was Possible, was derived from my favorite scripture, my verse, um, Everything is Possible to the One Who Believes. And I think that's why I chose it as my, my title, because... I believe everything, not anything, everything is possible to the one who believes. Tears. Tears. Mm. Well, 
thank you so much for being on the show, Jen. This has been so much fun. This has been fantastic. I can't even speak straight. So, but thank you. You are, it is very, very, very clear. You are on a beautiful, fantastic, on purpose journey. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get everything as possible, and throw can't right out of the dictionary and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you. That, that was um, really well done, and it just because it was from the heart. So I appreciate that. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos coming up. And check out our website. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>